and this is uh, this is my week. So it seems like we're kind of we're we've telescoped uh, into the technical chapters and then back out to a few here at the end um, that are more opportunities for reflection and just talking about how uh, how these things you know play out in our context. So I appreciate um, all the the cameras on here because I thought we might do a little more discussing um, than we have you know in some of the weeks. Um, but I did do a little bit of summarizing also on, on PowerPoint slides. So I'll share a little bit of that. Um, so the, the week, the chapter was about uh, introducing data science tools to your education job. And here are a couple of the points they made, the kind of organizing ideas I'd say of the chapter are that um, some advantages of doing data analysis with R where people might have been using Excel or something like in the past, that in the past are um, boosts in speed that might not initially be apparent, um, but because you can uh, repeat your analyses, if you, you know, keep track of the, uh, the code that you've used and that sort of thing, uh, you can iterate on uh, people's questions. So people ask you questions and you can um, use a snippet of code that you've used in the past to answer pretty quickly. And by being able to do that, you, uh, you sort of embed the analyses in um, a nice conversation about analysis and you kind of liberate people to be, um, you know, not lose their train of thought necessarily. The question is still fresh in their mind when you come back with an answer and you're able to, um, you know, give an answer that might provoke new questions for them. So both kind of encouraging a sense of possibility and also just natural organic development of what the like authentic questions are. And then another point they made is that um, that dynamic um, of being able to act quickly on things and especially being able to like clean data quickly and that sort of thing encourages people to generate um, more data where they might not necessarily be thinking of what, what data they're generating if they know it's gonna take a long time to do anything with it. But if you can um, kind of reduce the friction associated um, with it, you can encourage people to, uh, to generate more and then get kind of a positive feedback loop going with um, data and then questions and um, dialogue around those. So they also provided just a variety of strategies that you can use um, in, your, in your job. So kind of along the lines of what I was saying, look for opportunities to do those repeatable analyses, um, keep track of the code you've used and reuse it where you can, uh, look for similar like places in your organization where there's lots of similarly structured data so that you can um, reuse those things. Uh, they suggest keeping a notebook with the questions that you're asked so that you can anticipate what the common types of questions people ask are. And, um, and then also uh, prototype your analyses. So run something quickly and get feedback on it and see how people are interpreting um, what you're giving them. So I thought I would share a, a little bit of an example here. Uh, this is not an example of rapid iteration, but I just yesterday had a meeting with an instructor who I've been working with um, over the course of the semester on some analyses. And I've sent him a couple of times um, like graphs of early analyses that I had done. This is an organic chemistry class and we are both trying to understand like students click behavior within the course and which resources students are using and how those like students that use particular kinds of resources might be doing better on exams and then also making some regression models and see how well we can predict um, exam grades at the end of the course based on early semester um, patterns. And so for example, I had, I had sent him, uh, this is a count of how, of how many of a particular kind of resource students used in the first eight weeks of, or the first eight lessons of class. And I grouped it by that and just gave exam scores that the students had gotten in this organic chemistry class at the end of the semester. And when I originally sent this to him, I had the axes flipped so that the number of the resources students had downloaded was on the x-axis. And everybody I showed it to kept interpreting that as time. 
and thinking that as students went further in time and downloaded resources for like lesson eight and lesson seven, you know, uh, they, they were just having trouble understanding what, what the graphic was showing them. So I uh, tried iterating and flipping the axes. I thought about using proportions rather than numbers that might be misinterpreted as dates or something like that, but uh, ended up just flipping the axes and I have not had the misinterpretations with this one um, that I did with them flipped around the other way. And the, I just, you know, it's taken me quite a while to get this done. So it wasn't rapid there, but just in the course of stepping him through some answers to the questions that he had asked me a couple months ago, uh, it definitely generated like pages and pages of new questions that, um, that we want to answer. So now it's a matter of prioritizing which ones, um, which ones to answer, but it was really a generative, um, a generative conversation. So I think that for me, uh, supports some of what was coming out of, um, of the chapter. Uh, Isabel, were you maybe going to say something or I thought I saw you turn, like unmute yourself or? No, no, no. I was oh. just reading the graph. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, they suggested using tools like uh, PER to work with many data sets at once. Um, and also, I guess maybe I should have ordered this differently, but anticipating the questions that people are most likely to ask and then being ready to be able to conduct analyses on those. So they suggested adding, like if you know that there's an intervention that's taken place and that people might wanna know whether students who got the intervention are doing behaving differently than those who didn't, uh, you know, make sure that they're, you've got a column um, in the data set related to, to that intervention so that you could um, just pull up, you know, the analysis as quickly as you can. Uh, they also gave some helpful um, questions that you could ask, such as whenever you're solving any, um, or whenever you're answering any questions, also think what questions could you answer by looking at a level up from this. So if you're computing averages or something in, in a single classroom, what else could you do by basically using very similar um, code, but applying it at the level of, say, the school and looking at comparisons across classrooms or something like that. I thought that was a helpful, um, helpful suggestion about just an easy way to generate lots of new questions. And then toward the end of the chapter, they suggested these empathy strategies, um, really listening carefully and kind of uh, dialoguing with uh, the people you're working with to try to understand their um, their needs better and their questions. And then they also use this language of like, can I borrow your problem for um, for a little bit and take it away, take the, you know, take it off their plate for a little while and um, take a few steps to advance the analysis or clean the data and then bring it back to them. And I think part of this was a, about bringing people along a little bit in their own, um, in their own data analysis skills. So uh, those are, I don't know, those are kind of a rundown of some of the strategies that, that were mentioned in here. I think there are a few probably that I've, that I've left out too, but I wanted to just pause there and think, um, what have your experiences been with these strategies? Have you, have you tried them? Um, and some of my questions are, are there enough cases where existing people's existing tasks can benefit from these strategies? Uh, I thought a lot of them were useful, but uh, the like qu calculating quiz averages or something. It seems like we've kind of already got tools that people use to do that. So I don't know that that specific example, you know, resonated completely with me. Um, and I also wondered if people perceive this procedure as faster, if like teachers perceive it as uh, faster, if it involves sending their their problem out to somebody else and having to wait for a reply where Excel might take more minutes for somebody, but they can do it themselves. So uh, I'm going to bring it back to the group here and just think what were people's reactions to strategies that were proposed there and uh, have they worked for you? Um, so I kind of related, but not exactly. I, I know what I've done a lot of work on is there's a lot of data gathering at my institution mm -hmm. and then no one did anything with it right we just we just we gather data we gather data 
but no one has the time to actually analyze it. And I know that's, that's a lot of what I've worked on of finding out, hey, you gathered this data. Would you mind if I took a look at it for you? And, and actually, it, you know, a lot of what I do is just transform it into visualizations so that it's easier to digest of what's going on. Um, so, so that's what I've been doing. I've never had, I've never encountered a situation where someone was actively working on an analysis th themselves and I borrowed it. I, I wouldn't use that language. It's just more of a, this department has been doing this survey, uh, you know, registrar has been gathering this data from the forms. Uh, we have these students participating in tutoring and such and such, and we have all this data, but then it just sits there because no one, no one has the time to comb through it and really get anything out of it. So that's, that's more my experience of just like saying, hey, have you been sitting on data that you wish you had time to analyze, but you just don't, you know? So, so that's more my experience. What kind of effect does it have when there is all this collection and no analysis? Does that breed a particular kind of culture or response? Um, I... Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say, so there, there's been some things when I've reached out and said, hey, I know, for example, um, like a, the one of our writing centers, I've reached out and said, hey, I would, I would, if you have it, I would love this data from you of what students are using the writing center. And they've reached back and said, we really haven't collected any data on that. Why would you want that? And then I had to explain, this is what I want to do with, you know, here's other programs that have provided me this data and this is what I've done with it. And then they got really excited and been like, oh yeah, I, I want to know that. And yes, I will start collecting the data in this way so that you can do that analysis on it. Um, so I've had positive responses like that. Um, I've, I've definitely had responses of, I don't see how that would do any good. Uh, for example, I, I'm kind of throwing my math tutoring under, under the bus. I, I did the same thing with the math tutoring and they essentially said, why would you need to analyze it? We know it works. Like, why would you take, why would you take the time to analyze it when we know it already works? Um, so, so I've, I've also gotten that response. So there's definitely, you know, there's definitely mixed responses of, um, well, we haven't been analyzing it because there's no, there's no use, right? It's not like we're going to change anything by analyzing it. So why bother, um, from, I didn't know we had that capability. Yeah, I'm interested. Um, so definitely a huge range. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting range. I mean, I, what I was anticipating was maybe that there was like a, a fatalism or something or like that just, you know, collecting things because that's what you always do, but never using it or something. It seems like a bad dynamic to like expectation that to, to have for people, right? To, <laughs> to collect it all and then it never gets used. Well, I, like if and you can I, be the I one loved... who... I yeah. loved what was pointed out in the chapter. Uh, I'm going to misquote it, sorry. But essentially it was like, when we're not doing anything with the data, there's less data collected. And the more we can do with the mm -hmm. data, the more people will feel like, uh, you feel like, oh, it's actually useful. Let's collect more and then you can get better insights. I, I probably said that wrong, but there was something along the lines in that chapter. Yeah, definitely. Um, and when you go to like the writing center, are you able to show them the visualizations that you made for a different group or something? And they yeah. say, oh, I want. I, yeah, I want so, so in that case, I can. There, there are definitely lots of visualizations I've done that I, I can't share, yeah. um, especially, I mean, in particular, uh, when I'm doing race and ethnicity 
uh, data analysis, there's only very particular people at my institution I can share that with. So that's not something I can share, but these, the analysis that I do with these initiatives, like the, like the, like the writing center, um, I, I can more freely show to other departments of like, this is what I did for them. And, and here's what their results were. Are you interested in something like this? Nice. How about other folks? Uh, have you tried any of these strategies or had experience with how they work? At least my personal experience, when I first started at the foundation, um, I was the only R user and I, and then they slowly built up the analytics team, but there was no sort of uh, technical requirement to use any program. Um, and so my colleagues would use like SPSS or Excel or things like that. And <laughs> I think like it just, the sheer amount of like repetition needed to like clean data from the California Department of Ed, like, and then like realizing you made a tiny mistake and having to go back and like fix it all, like versus, you know, just changing like a character or something in strip, like over, over time, I think, um, like, again, because it wasn't like ex an explicit ask or anything, like just through the collaboration and like showcasing of, of what um, reproducible code could do, like slowly my, my colleagues started to adopt R. I know. We all know R, which is like fantastic, just in terms of like the the amount of sharing and collaboration that we could do now. That before, like, um, it would just require a few extra steps too, right? Because documentation in Excel would look different than um, than if you're writing an R. So, so that, that's just like uh, an example of how we tried one of those strategies. So yeah. I. I'm the only R user uh, at my institution, and I'm a, I'm a team of one. I'm kind of in this weird situation where I work closely with institutional effectiveness, but I'm not part of institutional effectiveness. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things I, I showed the director of institutional effectiveness was something I did of data she provided me in Excel and then what I did with it. And I showed her some of the code that I use to do it. And she was just like, why would you have taken the time to write all this code when you could have just done that in, in Excel? Cause she just uses SPSS and Excel. And I said, well, now next time you send me the exact same data, which I know she does, right? She does it in the same format every semester. I'm like, well, next semester, I don't have to do anything. I changed the file name and it just generates it. And she was like, oh, wow, that's cool, <laughs> you know? And so, and so I, I think there is this disconnect of all they see initially is how much time it took you to do it up front. And it's having this conversation of, Yes, I know it took more time initially, but it's going to save us so much time going forward. Yeah. Edgar, uh, is that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to completely agree. Like, just to pick on California Department of Education, <laughs> like, it's, it's every year, even if it changes slightly, like, the amount of time that first year just makes, like, you know, the next four years. Uh, so much more of a lighter lift that, um, yeah, it, it definitely like balances out by the end. Do you have those things stored in places where other people could use them? If uh, I don't know, I was kind of wondering if anybody would resist these because you might get dependent on on a single person who knew how to do it or whatever. Do you do you have systems for sharing or building other people's capacity? I guess you've said you do. But. Yeah, well, at least internally, we have um, like a private GitHub repository. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I suppose if all of us left at the same time, then maybe nobody would know where to find it. But hopefully, like uh, one person will be able to pass the baton on to whoever like needs to do these analyses in the future. Mm -hmm. I was thinking if Morgan left, the uh, R capacity of... <laughs> 
I would dry up quick, but. That's true. We have a shared drive. Um, again, I, I don't know if I should say this. Our institution struggles in general with information sharing between departments. Like there's just this huge issue with information silos. One department has no clue what another department is doing. And that's one of the things I'm trying to work on, even with these um, initiatives, right? Even when, when I first started, one of the things I tried to do, I, I didn't even finish, but I tried to meet with all these departments to say, okay, what things are you doing outside the classroom to help students? Like what clubs do you have? Like, do you have routine guest lectures? What tutoring do you offer? You know, like anything and everything you can think of that you do for your students outside the classroom, what are you doing? And um, a lot of the responses I got to that was just like, well, what are other departments doing? Like no one has any clue what other departments are doing. Um, and, and there's a desire there, right? Um, and I see that a huge issue also with the survey distribution, right? I, I have a huge concern about survey exhaustion for our students. And whenever someone sends out a survey, they have no clue what other surveys the students have seen. They just have no idea. Like, and, and I don't know exactly how to fix that, but that's something I would love to fix going forward is like, okay, is there a place that when you send out a survey to students like that we can compile it and post like, I'm sending out this survey to these students, um, you know, even if they don't feel comfortable sharing the results, like as long as there's a way to know, like this student has received like a hundred surveys in the past year, like, you know, just something so that we know what's going on um, so that we're not creating the survey exhaustion. But yeah, it's, it is crazy. There, there's a lot of things I wanna tackle. Yeah, I'm sure you're not the only organization that has, <laughs> has those issues. We certainly have, just in COVID, everyone would like to have some information about how students are reacting to things that have gone on and no one can figure out, like someone heard about a survey that someone did, but it's unclear who has access to, to the data. So. <laughs> Uh, I think a part here was working with more data. And so I think the ability, so we primarily use like Excel and like Microsoft Access. And so we have like, one of the problems that I think really emphasize is like, you can work with more data in R and, you know, the classic Microsoft uh, application not responding or whatever they call it, or it doesn't work. So the thing was like, we we're, we're going to a new system. So they needed to validate data for like transcript comments for like all the students, like literally all the students. And so it was like millions of records. And so you can just open that up in R using through the, the their SQL connection. And so I did that in R and then she, the person trying to validate the data wasn't even able, able to open it in access. And so I asked her, I was like, what would you do if you you couldn't open it and she would have went, she said, well, I just would have went with what was in the system. And so you can, I think the discrepancies of being able to handle like massive amounts of data and like even joining data and, and stuff like that, I think the power of R is, is to work with more and also work with more quickly, I think is very important. I think a lot of people don't under, uh, maybe can kind of overlook that. Like I can do easily do that in Excel. I can pivot here and there, but I think once you extrapolate and get to a lot of data, I think that's where R really, really shines over these, you know, traditional formats. Is something that I, you know, that I notice. Um, in some ways, I think that folks here are in higher ed institutions more, and it, that might be a better case for some of these strategies than the, the like quiz score examples that were in the chapter actually, um, just in terms of scale and scope of data and stuff. Um, uh, Alyssa, is that, uh, sorry, I'm, I have trouble reading while I'm Oh, while sorry, I'm I just was giving an idea to Morgan because she talked okay. about surveys. So I just wanted to offer an idea for 
Uh, when Morgan was talking earlier, I was also thinking that Edgar, you've talked recently about um, introducing your boss to R. I think, and I just wondered if that if you had yeah. any. So that's that's still a work in progress. Uh, <laughs> so she kind of so I think she's come along where like if I show her the code, she can understand it much better now. Um, from the beginning, she would just look at it and she wouldn't understand it at all. But I think now she's kind of like picked up pieces of like, yo, select means this. And like group by means or distinct is the equivalent to group by an access. And so I think slowly but surely kind of drawing the connections between both what she knows and what we know, I think is going to make the process. I don't know if she'll ever get to the point where she can write code, but I think being able to like just show her and be like, well, I need another set of eyes just in case she has the ability to just run the code herself. And I think, again, another highlight of ours are, is a collaboration you can do. I can just send her the script and she can just run it versus like I've always come across in Excel where she does calculations in there. And I, I spent like 20 minutes trying to figure out where those numbers came from. And eventually I never, I, uh, sometimes I never figure out where they come from at all. And so I'm like, well, it looks like I just got to start over again. And it's just like, I've been trying to improve my documentation in R a lot more. But I think, again, I think that it's another highlight of you can share code, you can work with other people, even though they might not write it, you can always just run it themselves and kind of check, make sure things are right. Any other strategies that have worked for, uh, for other folks? Um, so, over the past year, um, we've I've, we've created an internal like data team um, where we're trying to do some of the things that you're that you attempted, Morgan. Um, where we're at least within our organization, right? We're one organization within the university, and the university generally has over the past five years has really um, invested a lot of money into uh, data and and. Uh, and making sure there's one source of truth on certain things because um, they've had some interesting conversations with funders and things where they ask them, how many buildings do you have? And they'd give them three different answers. Or how many students do you have? They'd give them three different answers. Um, and we have that same problem within our organization. And so we're trying to use that momentum at, at the university level within our organization. So we've built out a team um, of you know data people um, and we've built out uh, kind of this calendar of data activities. Um, and so now we know we have over 200 data activities um, across two years, across all the 15 programs that we offer. Um, and so we're, we're now beginning to pinpoint where we can collaborate and streamline certain things um, or collaborate on and streamline certain things um, in terms of data collection so that we can then talk about the impact of our programs in stronger ways rather than kind of these patchwork um, ways that we do program by program. Um, but it's been, it's been, we haven't even, I haven't even brought on tools yet. We haven't even talked about tools. It's just been like data literacy and, and, and building out a culture. And um, because everyone varies on their you know, data literacy, there's people on, on the data team who are um, uh, PhDs, you know, and have an understanding of research and, um, but they don't understand like data management as well as, you know, doing a good research study. Um, so we're all kind of figuring that out together. <laughs> um, but then there's others who have just been part of a program for 15 years and um, uh, just kind of do things the way they do things. And so we're just trying to, you know, this past year, we've tried to get on everyone on the same page um, and then begin to identify, you know, cross or overlapping um, or similar enough data collection uh, activities so that we can move forward. I mean, this, so hopefully in year two is when we're going to start building out capacity um, when it comes to tools. Um, and I'm, I'm currently the, the only R user um, in my organization. And so, um, yeah, everyone uses lots of different things. So, um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to respect their current, um, um, uh, skill level or, or preferences when it comes to data uh, analysis. 
um, but, um, and I'm trying to find something that's sustainable, like for them, um, and, and preferably self-service um, when it comes to certain things. Um, so we're trying to, trying to figure that out still. So if, I'm, I'm wondering what, like, what strategies are involved in carrying out a process like this? It sounds like it's a kind of consensus building sort of process. Is it a matter of just like getting the right people in the meetings or taking a particular attitude where you accept, accept people's preferences and hope that as they talk to each other, they naturally come to more agreements or something like that? Or are there, I don't know, any takeaways from it? Yeah, I mean, as we move forward, um... You know, there's certain there's certain softwares and certain tools that the university um, prefers. You know, for example, you know we have a license for Qualtrics versus um, like um, Smartsheet or, or SurveyMonkey or whatever. Like, um, and so we can use the university's resources when it comes to stuff like that. And so we're going to try to. Um, uh, um, you know, sunset programs who use certain tools, we're going to try to sunset those tools and bring them on to, you know, tools like Qualtrics or, or Google, um, even Google Forms for some simple things. Um, but uh, so I think there is a plan to do that. And I think they know that that's coming. <laughs> um, but it is, it, it will be, I think, more, you know, talked about and um, supported in the coming year. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, you know, we just have so many trainings that are offered at the university level that we don't have to provide as much when it comes to certain, you know, the tools that are supported. Um, we just have to guide the pe guide people into those workshops or lessons or whatever. Um, and then just always be on call if they need something you know, more simple. Um, I don't is know if it, I answered your question, but mm. yeah, I'm just kind of feeling around for um, for strategies, I guess. But is it a is it a does it feel like a a straight line process or lots of steps forward and steps back? Like in some of the things that I've been I've been trying to convene certain groups, not of exactly the same kind, but um, I think we've got some ch like big picture changes coming down the pike that are going to. Uh, change a particular technical tool that people have been using and it's going to upset a lot of the progress that we've made. Um, and I don't know if that's how typical that is, or it, it feels like it's hard to, uh, hard to get, I don't know, hard to get people to commit to something if you can't trust that the tool, if, but somebody in the organization isn't going to make a change or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I think what I, what I, I have a, a a couple other people who are kind of like the core team um, of this group. And we've, we talked about like in this first year, we're gonna identify those, well, all the tools that people use, figure out the ones that are actually supported by the university, begin to identify like where we wanna go. And then in year like three, we would choose a few different programs, just a couple of them and begin building out um, something that we could then scale in year four. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't have to be, you know, uh, dealing with 15 different types of bugs, but we only have, you know, three, only three types of different, you know, bugs um, and, uh, or, you know, different use cases. And so um, that's, that's kind of like how that, how that's going to look, I'm not quite sure, but we're, we're going to take that kind of at, at a scaled approach um, uh, so that we're not hand, having, having to handle 15 things um, in, in this like initial draft of building out this plan. <clears throat> so I had a next slide in which I moved toward other important strategies and we've already checked off almost, all, we've all really, already really checked off all of them in general. But one just kind of point that I was gonna try to make is that I didn't think that the chapter was talking too much about like, 
political issues or something in your organization. Um, that is sort of what Ryan is is getting at, although in a very consensus sort of way. But what I came away from the chapter thinking was like, if you are just really helpful to people and they might be tentative about the technology, but you can break through that by showing them the value or something along those lines. Um, but I wondered if uh, there might not be a tendency from data people to like think in those terms, but whether there are other political issues in organizations that uh, should be attended to in order to to make these kinds of gains. I don't know. Does any, I don't know if that resonates at all. But does anybody have like thoughts about how to negotiate the politics of organizations with your data strategies? So I don't have like maybe the best advice, but like everything that I that we do or promote, we make sure that it's been you know at least there's one thumbs up from the top. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, or preferably two thumbs up, right? Um, we, um, you know, we call ourselves, you know, a collaborative working group that's, you know, that's not, we're not a decision-making group. We're not, um, you know, we're, we're, nobody's at the director level. We're all just like staff um, people, right? Um, and so we know our boundaries. We understand that, that we have a particular boundary. Um, and so any sort of, um, you know, quote unquote decision or path forward or vision. And I have to get it. I want to make sure that that's approved by at least my supervisor, who's kind of our sponsor, or our champion, um, or, you know, and then one, one above her is the director of the organization. So, um, and so, and then we make sure that we report out at least once a year. Um, I mean, we're only in our first year, but we've reported out um, to the directors, all the directors, and gave them like, hey, this is what has been approved this past year, and this is what we've done, right? Um, and this is what we plan on doing in the next year, you know, any feedback, right? Um, so we've made sure that we've included the top because we, at least how our organization is, is works, right? Um, at least, and it has been in the past, at least is very top down. Um, and so we try to, yeah use that to our advantage while also trying to build a consensus, right? So. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like having someone from leadership also be able to ask like, hey, did you attend this webinar? Have you looked at this data? Have you, you know, talked to Isabella about this data analysis? Like, it's, like it really helps in, <laughs> in terms of like the uptake and actual like use of, of the data um, to have people in leadership behind you. So one that one that I was thinking, which is not exactly the same as leadership, but my group has been trying to connect our proposals to stated like missions or visions that we know that our leadership is bought into. Um, we'll run through a, a proposal or something and, and then realize we don't have it really connected to what we know the organizational priority priorities are. So um, it seems to be working for us so far, just hammering back and forth, back to the, the Carolina next plan that we know the chancellor is all in on. And um, uh, yeah, it seems like a decent strategy. Anything else? Well, I, I don't have a success story yet, but I know my strategy has been just trying to build relationships and trust, right? And to feel out who, you know, who really believes in using data to make decisions and who doesn't. Um, and just, you know, try, I don't know, just building those relationships and understanding okay, who, you know, who are my allies here and who, who do I still need to convince, <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, if, if you could get, if you could get someone high up, um, I know for me, because I'm so new, I, I try to navigate a lot of, okay, once I feel out who my allies are, you know, how much do they understand the political game of the institution and getting their insight of, you know, 
you know, so-and-so will like it if you present it this way, or you really need so-and-so to buy into this to move forward, you know, so, so for me as a noob uh, to my organization, I'm, I'm building those relationships. And then those who I really feel like are on my side and support me, then I can get their insight of what else do I need to do to play the political game of getting things moved forward. That's excellent. Yeah. Ally building and yeah, I guess if, if you don't know how to play it, which I often don't, make sure you have allies who do. So that um, one thing you said there was people who you know are committed to using data and those who are, are more opposed to it. And that maybe brings me to kind of last thing I wanted to talk about, which is like threats or risks to data science adoption in universities. Um, and what the sources of those resistance might, might be. Um, uh, it's easy to be sunny about these things, but you know, it's hard to get, <laughs> it's hard to get stuff done. And there are, I, as I read through this, I kept thinking of places where I thought people might, like it's not all just helpful answers to questions. You know, sometimes these things um, threaten people's autonomy, for example, or, um, you know, some of these things are zero sum. If influence, if there's more influence in one place or more of a reference to data, then the, you know, there's less influence in some other place. What do you guys think, uh, or what have you seen of, um, of risks and threats to this sort of thing? Well, let me know if I'm talking too much. I definitely want other people <laughs> to talk, but I know, Go right ahead. I know, um, things I've seen people resistant to. So especially for me, when it comes to faculty buy-in, mm -hmm. uh, faculty is always afraid that, I'm, that the data is going to be used to evaluate faculty. Um, my position specifically is purely about student success. So persistence and retention and graduation. I don't I don't evaluate faculty at all, but I know the resistance is they don't want to give certain pieces of data because they're always afraid that it's going to be used for faculty evaluation um, and that the data is going to be used as a, a way to justify punishment in some fashion um, instead of truly being used to just focus on helping students. Um, so that's a huge barrier I get from faculty. Um, I know for advisors, um, they don't, uh, because students are so individual, they don't, they either feel like it's not helpful because it's all, it's telling them what they already know, right? or that it's kind of doing a one size fits all, which, um, which it doesn't, but you know, that's, that's a hurdle we have to get over to of like, we can't evaluate the students all the same way because students are unique and individual and how could data help us with student success when success is, means different things for different students and yada, 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 that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so there's, so I, I feel like that those are the two barriers I face often is just the data will be misused, right? It will be used as a weapon, right? So it's the data's, the data's the hammer and they're afraid that it's going to turn into a, a, a murder weapon instead of a, a, a building tool. And the other side of, um, humans are unique and you can't plug them into an algorithm and get anything useful out of it that maintains their humanity or whatever the case might be, right? So those, those are the, yeah. the blockades I face. Yeah, your point about faculty resistance and evaluation was the first thing that I wrote down. Even reading the chapter and thinking about how they said it would be so easy to run the same 
quiz averaging scores for every uh, every class in the school or something like that um, just made me picture the reactions from the teachers who might worry that they'd then be seen as an easy grader or an ineffective teacher or something if their scores were low. Um, at the K-12 level too, teachers have a lot of experience with people coming in with algorithms to evaluate them and not understanding context and, and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of mistrust um, around that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I think just yeah. to add to that point, so we have like, we had the same discussion on like core success rates, like, like what about a faculty member who's curious about another faculty member's success rates and stuff like that. So we had that discussion, but I think you can kind of get around that by saying, you know, limiting it, limiting it to certain people only accessible to certain information, giving it to deans and stuff like that. But I think on top of that, there was also another discussion of, well, you know, we strive for equity among students, but also we strive for equity among, you know, faculty members and making sure it's a, it's a good workplace. And so there was discussion of like, what about um, equity within pay within higher education? But then you have discrepancies on that discussion of that's going to be a very hard discussion to have when it comes to like, what's the equity among pay within faculty members? And that might have some backlash. And so I think recognizing from their perspective and also from ours of, you know, kind of reconciling those, those differences. But I think, yeah, I think your guys' points, I think. And I think another one, so having allies, not also within the university, but also outside of the university, I think is also important. I know that for me specifically, there are there are users at different community colleges in Washington that I think having them and, you know, kind of building uh, a movement forward at different universities might be another strategy to kind of go at. So you can say, well, they're doing it over there too. So, you know, it seems like it's something that's going to gain momentum. So why don't we, you know, be some of the pioneers and kind of push that forward and do new direction. That's a really excellent point. I'm glad I'm glad that came up, um, building that community that can lobby among other data people. In my my main life as an instructional designer, we've finally gotten a group of all the instructional designers around campus that meets regularly and can lobby for new tools and, um, and that kind of thing. And it, I think it applies in both cases. Other thoughts? Risks and threats? I've got a couple couple more, but um, what else? Any other cases where you think administrators might see threats coming from use of data? I think the salary issue is, is somewhat related to administration, but I'm wondering what else from that corner. In uh, my university, there's this kind of third party system academic analytics that um, our university uses amongst other universities. And the pushback there from faculty is not necessarily, um, it is about evaluation, so similar, but that's specific to research productivity. So like how much output are they, like are they publishing enough? And the kind of this like objective way of evaluating and um, the worry there is using kind of analytic data or analytics that's even outside the university to evaluate and in turn like affect tenure or something or tenure try. So that's definitely something that's been kind of um, rampant in our, in our school. And then, and also like to Edgar's point about like who gets to see what, I know that there's a very specific, um, I guess policy in our university to only show it with deans and not specific faculty members. And it's kind of like this, I don't even know what my opinion of it is because for me it's like transparency is the best, but I don't know exactly what they're using the data for in terms of decision making because that's like way beyond me, my, my role, but um, there's definitely that threat of like, what are you using it for and how, how to, and it's not an internal metric, it's some kind of this objective kind of way of evaluating. So that's definitely something that's come up. Recently. Yeah, that academic analytics question is very naughty, isn't yeah. it? Um, I think to, to Alyssa's point on, we've had, you know, as a commission, there's like third party organizations that say, you know, to be, to receive our grants or to receive this, you have to give us our data or, you know, oh, there's this new company of like, provide us your data, we'll put it in Tableau, make it really pretty and then give it back to you and sell it to you. And there are concerns of like, is that really the right way to spend 
public money is that it's our own data. Are there concerns of like, should you, you know, pay these companies and stuff like that? I think those might be higher level questions where the administration wants this new tool, but as like data analysts, you might say, well, what, we can just do that ourselves or we don't think it's right. We don't think it's a good use of our time for us to compile this data, give it to them and for them to give it back to us. So I think the, there might be some friction there. And I think we especially have come across that friction, friction with organizations you know, regarding that, that issue. On the administrative level, I was also just thinking uh, there are lots of opportunities or lots of cases here where I think data has the potential to surface patterns that people don't want to be seen or don't want to make public. Um, in the Chapel Hill schools, you know, after No Child Left Behind, it revealed, a, uh, you, you know, uh, race and class and such based uh, differences that really caused a reckoning. And I, that, you know, the data did become seen, but I could imagine lots of cases where people wouldn't want that um, kind of thing to be seen or would want to tightly control who, who sees that and who doesn't. Uh, in a, a little bit less charges of a situation, but with, within my group, we, we have a, a videography team and an instructional design team, and we could get data on which, like, which of the videos we make are getting watched, or are they getting watched, which is really useful for knowing, you know, where the resources should, should go, and uh, I know that a certain kinds of resource videos that we put a lot of effort into producing weren't getting watched very much. Um, and I have been for a, a year or so now trying to like nudge little pieces of data in the right directions be, uh, so that we know which of our efforts are, are helpful, but doing it in the wrong way is like a threat to the existence of a, a department or something like that, right? Or a, a, a team and you obviously have to be really careful with that kind of thing. Um, my last point, uh, kind of back to the faculty, uh, end of things, a little bit different from the evaluation question, but I think people also see these things as threats to autonomy and forces of kind of standardization. If you might need to give the same quiz to make it comparable across multiple sections or classrooms or something like that. And certainly a lot of faculty really cherish their ability to teach something the way they see it. And that they see lots of kind of creeping um, threats of, uh, of standardization. I mean, I think, understandably in a lot of um, a lot of cases uh, any uh, any final thoughts from anybody on any of this all right well thank you all for coming and uh, I don't know are we getting we got like one or two more weeks here Isabella do you know I know we're, we're close to wrapping up and thank you all so much um, well thank you Rob for for uh, this great discussion and then thanks all for engaging in this book club but yeah we're almost almost wrapped up <laughs> uh, Ryan and I will talk about what to do for next week or the next couple weeks and yeah we'll reach out on the slack but thanks all right thanks okay. everybody have a good night thanks for, thanks Rob